Hello, this is the Coach and Benway podcast. I'm Coach Red Pill. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Benway. Dr. Benway, how's it going? It's going up, but neither, but not down. Okay, that, that's a that's a very uh, cautiously optimistic intro, I suppose. So today we're going to be talking about something different, something a little bit uh, more more meta, if you will. We're going to be talking about people that we have been taught to revere, or, or rather, to vilify as villains, and whom we, uh, Benway and I, have come to reconsider as heroes. Um, Benway, why, why don't you introduce the topic a little bit better, more articulately than I have just now? Yeah, so, so those of you who've sat with us for a long time have probably heard almost ad nauseum how many times we have tried to rescue Nixon from the flames of history a number of occasions. So when we talked about the Vietnam War, we naturally came to the conclusion that no, m- more than anyone else, Nixon was the one trying to end that situation. I think for a number of other episodes, we've talked about how you know Nixon was more approachable than the Kennedys, a little bit more honest than the Kennedys, above and beyond the war just in general. So that got me thinking. It's like, well, I'm sure there we have a lot more hobby horses than Richard Nixon on this topic. Though <laughs> he's he's clearly an easy one to remember and talk about because it was just so obvious that you know they wanted to portray him as a twisted guy who can't even talk. He probably hasn't taken a shit in 30 years, you know, kind, yeah. kind of thing. Uh, you know, but you know, when we were you know shooting the breeze back and forth all the way, I believe we were go- as we were going through time and say, you know, well, this person's better than that or that person's better than that. I remember I I joked and said, well. What were the you know how how out out of out for lunch am I going to be if I try to make the case that the conquistadors were actually much better for the world than not and then you really latched onto that one yeah yeah because you know think about it going back to the conquistadors it was a liberation okay now now the reason my my thinking went along those lines is as follows there was an article recently that uh, they they found some um, these racks of skulls in Mexico City be- before it was Mexico City when it was uh, back when it was uh, Tenochtitlan. Uh, they they found the the Aztecs would ritually uh, sacrifice hundreds, probably thousands of people, and they would uh, mount their heads on these racks. Okay, these racks had like like these long wooden uh, uh, rods, and what they'd do is they'd smash a hole in the temple of the skull of the man or victim because it was men, women, children. They would smash a hole in the on on one side of the temple. Uh, right through the other and shove the stick through it, right? This this wooden pole through it. And they'd mount these racks of hundreds and hundreds of skulls, right? And, um, you know, the the the, the an- archaeologists and anthropologists who discovered this were all trying to excuse it away and just say all kinds of things. They were almost saying that, you know, the people wanted to be sacrificed. You know, it was absurd, okay? Because what would probably happen was that these people who were being sacrificed, they didn't want to be sacrificed. And they were sacrificed uh, barbarically. And what did the Spanish do? They arrived, they brought Christianity, and they prohibited any more human sacrifices. This is a good thing, okay? How is this a bad thing? But no, you know, the conquistadors are evil, you know, and the, and the um, Aztecs were good. I'm, I'm sort of being facetious, but not totally. I mean, think about it. Huh? Well, I, it's not entirely facetious. I mean, in fact, it, it's funny. I think in retrospect, people see the troll element of of uh, Mel Gibson's movie Apocalypto. Yeah. In, in that it actually depicts this very situation where a small, you know, arguably worth, not worthless tribe, but certainly a tribe that's not a very humble. anybody. Yeah. Very humble, not really doing much of anything to anybody is captured by the Aztecs or some variation on them. Yeah. And begins, you know, not just like hunted and cruelly abused and like just treated like cattle, but, you know, he gets pulled into the sacrificial ceremonies and he manages to escape his way out, fights his way to the shore, and he looks out to the distance for the some sort of hope or salvation. And what does he see but the Spanish conquistadors and the priests right. uh, on right. the boats right. coming to land. And this actually more or less happened. I mean, we tend to forget that the part of the case for Christianity, because we just take it for granted, was one of the key stories in the early Bible is the notion that human sacrifice will no longer ever be demanded yeah. of this church. And it will ensure that it will never happen anywhere that the Christian uh that the Christian faith. sword rules. Yeah. yeah, where the Christian faith is predominant. Yeah, yeah, uh, because all the pagan religions were into human sacrifices. They didn't have a problem with it. I mean, think of the Romans, you know. They were throwing people to the lions all the time. It was no big deal. 
Okay, and look at these Aztecs. They were savages. They were savages. And the Europeans, what did they do? They came and they conquered. And here's the thing. See, the Spaniards, the Spaniards who arrived, right, they were a tiny group of men. They were tiny, okay? It wasn't a massed army of thousands and thousands of, of Spaniards, okay? It was a rinky-dink little outfit of a couple of hundred at best in some of these expeditions, a couple of hundred men at best, okay? They arrived and they took it over. How did they take over an empire of thousands and thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people? How did they do it? Because the tribes, the local tribes, helped them because they viewed the Aztecs and the Incas as uh, hegemonic, uh, unjust overlords who were demanding human sacrifices. That was how the Spaniards won. Okay, it's as simple as that. Okay, and, and these people who joined Christianity, they were relieved to join Christianity because here was a religion that believed in one God. So it's, you know, easy. You know, it's just the one guy that you have to worship, not a whole bunch of them. And most important of all, this God did not want your head. He just wanted you to like kneel and go to Sunday church service. How hard can that be compared to human sacrifice? I ask you, Benway, please tell me. What do you, what do you think of that? Well, when you put it that way, I have, I have to think about it. No, I mean, it's very clear. I, 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 this may be an apocryphal story, too. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably true. Was I think before Cortez reached Tenochtitlan, mm -hmm. uh, he actually encountered one of the smaller tribes in the, the women I think he encountered. I forget her name. Mm -hmm. was a survivor of one of the raids uh, you know, that the Aztecs did on the local tribes. And she actually taught him how to behave and convince them that he was a representative or a manifestation of... Uh, uh, Katsukowote, I think the uh, the you know the dragon god uh, who was the arch god. If you return from the sea, you know big shit will happen to the Aztecs. And she said you're going to wear black because that black is his color and everything. So she prepped him on oh. how to handle the situation. This may be apocryphal. I, I I don't know, but I think it's probably true, or at least some elements of it are true. I and I think you know, and and that's the that's the certain thing. You 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 took you certainly took advantage of an empire that was very brutal. That it's like when you think about how these raids would have happened. I mean, I'm sure for those of you who've seen movies like, you know, uh, um, uh, Conan the Barbarian, you know, like the, you know, the raid at the beginning of yeah. the movie, no. people get wiped out or alternatively, if you, <laughs> if you really think about it in a more arch exp expression, imagine if like a group of aliens came and just started abducting your ass and started, you know, extracting what they needed from you. Yeah, That's exactly. That's how extreme the situation was. Yeah, exactly. See, these people, the Incas and the Aztecs and the Mayans, they weren't nice people. They were savages. Let's face facts. I mean, they were involved in human sacrifice, and there's no way to explain human sacrifices as a good thing. Okay, these anthropologists, these anthropologists and archaeologists today who are trying to explain it away, that's the funny thing. They are trying to explain away how human sacrifice is a good thing, how people would want to be sacrificed on the altar of some foreign god. Imagine if, if uh, you know, some, some, I don't know, some um, Indian from India, from, you know, South Asia, some Indian sect snatched you and decided they were going to sacrifice you to one of their gods. Would you like that? Would you think it's a really good thing? No, you'd not want to be sacrificed on the altar of some crazy ass foreign god by these crazy ass people who you have nothing to do with. It would be, uh, uh, how can anybody think that that's a good thing? But you know, the, the PC, the political, the, the PC police cannot admit under any circumstances that the European conquerors were good. They have to say that they were bad. And well, well that's my point. My point well, is, these guys were good. They did good for these people. What's interesting that the mental gymnastics I often see, and I, uh, it's a joke I have, but I think it's fundamentally true. A, a lot of the left-wing folks who try to make the post-colonial reading of America's colonization by the whites, they more or less force you to have to believe some variation of uh, the Lion King version of the, the noble savage, the Americans, not just the noble savage, but like all creatures and tribes living more or less peacefully together. Oh, God, Everybody yeah. was more or less happy. It was essentially the garden of Eden. Blah, yeah. Blah, blah. yeah. They don't use those words, but it, it's you're pretty close. You're required to believe that in order to accept that, you know, the villain of the situation is always the white man. I mean, the, and I, I, it's funny whenever I listen to some people try to quote the Sioux, uh, of how you know you know they talk about you know the nobility of the 
the man and the land and they don't have ownership rights. I keep reminding him that the Lakota, the, the real name of the Sioux, got to the position where they are because when the Cheyenne or the Comanche tribe, you know, basically gifted them the <laughs> the use of horses, which, by the way, as we all know, came from the original conquistadors. The horses spread like wildfire mm -hmm. uh, across the continent. After the Lakota were gift, given the horses by, like I said, either the Cheyenne or the, the Comanche, I forget which tribe, they repaid them the favor by basically using the horses and, and killing off as much of the you know the Cheyenne tribe as they could yeah. and conquering them. The notion that these tribes were, you know, just minding their own business, had no sense of property, man, they were just digging it, you know, yeah. in their teepees, and it's nonsense. Yeah. They were tribal warriors like any other tribe. My response is, you're just pissed off because our tribe just happened to win. Yeah, basically. Because, look, uh, if you get you get to it, uh, all these these people, yeah, there's that myth that they were all like, it was like peace and love and harmony and everybody got along with everybody else. They were killing each other savagely. There are mass graves all over the place that predate uh, uh, the arrival of Columbus by hundreds of years. These people, ever since they arrived in the American continent, from, from Asia, they were killing each other in mass. Uh, and I don't even know why, because there were enough resources to go around. So that's an interesting conundrum, because it, it makes sense if you go out and there isn't enough resources and you go and kill somebody in order to get those resources. That I understand. That I don't have a moral problem with. It's, it's just, you know, the survival of the fittest baby. But this, this idea that there was all this land, there was all this space, there were all these resources, and yet still they decided that they wanted to go and kill one another just for kicks. Now that shows now something now, doesn't it? Well, they, they, the warriors of these various tribes, in some of the tribes, they had a special name. I forgot what it was. I actually recommend if you enjoyed Ken Burns' Civil War, one of his, his main co-writer on that wrote a, a similarly long uh, documentary called The West, where he talks about a lot of these things. And for, this was at a time when actually people were willing to say this. You even have some of the local... Native historians were saying, you know, people like to reflect on these things like everything was all beautiful. And they're like, yeah, there was some beautiful things, but there's some fucked up things, too, that we did. And yeah. she, you know, they cited about like these particular, uh, I think, dog soldiers or something. Or yeah, dog, dog soldiers. Warriors. Dog soldiers. Yeah, dog, yeah those, those were basically the, the celebrated warriors. They dressed up in their fineries. They went out and they just made murder. Mm. Well, you know, that's exactly more or less what you're accusing Westerners of. To a certain extent, you just go out on a fucking raid or a hunt, as it were. Well, that's the nature of the tribes. It's the nature of these tribal warfares. They happen. Well, the funny uh, thing is that th th this whole thing is like a ersatz religion, this belief in a Garden of Eden before the white man, and 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 that the white man was basically the the serpent in the garden kind of thing. It's it's just weird. It's it's so religious. It, it's it's a religious ideology, left wingism, SJWism. I mean, is there any other way to look at it? Uh. Well, the, uh, the way I look at it, which may be somewhat similar, is that you, in order to left, left wing ideology, postmodernist left wing ideology is a funny thing in which, like Marxism, it, it allows you to proclaim so many economic statements without knowing a damn thing about <laughs> economics. Mm. Similarly, uh, you know, these, this post colonial studies allows you to make grand sweeping pronouncements about sociological, anthropological situations when you you basically, in order to believe it, you have to know next to nothing about the tribes, how yeah. they interacted with each other, their history. I actually love reading about the tribes. I actually find them extraordinarily fascinating. I do think there is a, you know, you will see some nobility in the savage tribes. But I, you know, because I know all of this, I know that, you know, when you're bullshitting, I know that they were, you know, just as ruthless as we were. Yeah. You know, there's... A, there's an acceptance. Um, it was kind of the anti myth that I think came out large. I mean, uh, you know, don't take this with, you know, take this with some grain of salt, but you know, around the sixties, seventies, going into the eighties, there was the anti myth of the West, right? Where, you know, we had this long period of time, you know, in American history after the, the frontier closed, you know, we, the mythical notion of the Westerner, the cowboy is, is the great American hero go into the sixties, seventies and eighties that was criticized or began to be criticized and heavily criticized. And then you had to create a new myth, the noble savage, which was the true hero against this, you know, infecting force of the West. Uh, it's just another myth. It's just a counter myth in order to serve whatever political agitation you wanted to make at the time. And we still have to uncover our, or dig out from both of these situations. 
Was the cow, but the Western cowboy perfect? No, no human being ever could be. Uh, was the noble savage perfect? Again, no human ever could be. Uh, the reality is much more complicated. But in the complication, you have to admit, ironically enough, that the uh, the Western uh, settler, the conquistador, what have you, they had their reasons for doing their things. Not all of them were just for bloody murder. And a lot of times their enemies were even worse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so anyway, that that's insofar as, you know, this is the first enemy, or let me phrase it, the first uh, um, uh, person vilified that I consider a hero, that's the conquistadors, because the conquistadors came, they cleaned up house, they gave them Christianity, uh, which was a unifying religion, they stopped slaughtering each other because of it. I mean, they, you know, in, in, in the Americas, they kept on killing one another for other reasons. Now, the, the conquistadors are vilified because they brought diseases to the New World that hadn't been, you know, that hadn't been known to the New World. Well, that wasn't their fault. It wasn't like the, the, the conquistadors knew that they were bringing smallpox and, and the other diseases to the Americas. I mean, what, what's your take on that particular issue? Well, I mean, it went both ways. I mean, yes. Oh, the, yeah, we, we got yeah. gonorrhea and we got venereal and disease. Syphilis. We had syphilis. And syphilis, yeah. 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 In fact, you know, that in Renaissance, why part of the reason all the men and women were wearing lace it was to cover up the syphilis. That was part of the reason that stylistic design came in. Really? Uh, how, That's how, the, yeah, well, I may be over exaggerating, but in some instances, yeah, because you could see the rashes mm -hmm. on the wrist and the neck and what have you. So you would cover it up. Really? Uh, in, in theory, that's one of the, well, that's one of the things. I mean, as with all these things, there, you know, there's a practical cause in some instances, and then practical causes become stylistic sure. uh, desires. But I, I that was, remember reading that at one point. Really? That's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, I'd forgotten. The syphilis and the, yeah, it was two-way street. So, okay. But, uh, but I do believe that more people died in the Americas than in Europe from, from the respective diseases that they swapped. But I, I cannot see how that is the moral responsibility of the conquistadors. Had it not been the Spanish conquistadors, it would have been somebody else who arrived in the Americas. It was inevitable that Europeans or Asians would arrive in the Americas and bring diseases that the Americans were not, that the Native Americans, that is, were not accustomed to. Right. I mean, the, that, the notions or the understanding of virology was minimal at that yeah, point. But and it not existent. Yeah, I would guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it existed only to the effect that, like, you know, Romans knew that if you threw in, you know, dead animals, you know, into a sea, besieged city, it, it would cause sickness. Okay. But, you know, to know that, oh, you know, I'm going to just by virtue of me just having tolerated these diseases for a long point in time that I'm going to go into a brand new environment and everybody's going to die as a result. No way. That you know, our knowledge of, like I said, virology was anywhere close to understanding that concept. Yeah, exactly. Nor could they have even controlled for it at the time, obviously. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. So okay, so so the the your the Spanish Spaniards are off the hook insofar as that's re that regard, uh, which is devastating, no question. But it was not anybody's fault. It wasn't like they knew what they were doing or or trying to do it deliberately. So screw that. Uh, so anyway, so that's my 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 case for um, for for the. For the Spaniards being like the good guys of that particular movie, what about you? <laughs> what's your what's your villain whom you consider a hero? Well, we had talked. Uh, I'm wondering if I should go chronologically or the next one that's in my head. Uh, Do tell whatever. me what you prefer. No, either so, is fine. So I, I'm gonna, I'm going to really push it this time. I'm going to also say Franco, um, Francisco Franco. And I, and I'll tell you why this thought came to my head. I, I, do you hear me arguing with you? <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, go ahead. here's why. Here's what. Well, I'm, I'll go into the specific details, but I want to give the story of why I thought about his name before, and then I'll then we can go into it. So, I actually, when I was younger, so this was about ten years ago, I actually really liked the movie at the time, um, Pan's Labyrinth. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? Yeah, the, yeah. Okay, so those yeah. who know, Pan's Labyrinth is set at the end, uh, well, well after the the Spanish Civil War. So those who don't know. Spanish Civil War was between the fascists and the communists who were, you know, basically fighting for control of Spain. The communists ultimately lost for a variety of reasons, but for a long time there was still partisans fighting out in the countryside and the and Franco's army was trying to control for that man. Oh yeah, and, and also uh, also tell people that they weren't called communists, they were called um uh, republicans. Of course. Yeah. Because in theory, in theory, they won, they quote unquote, won the election <laughs> yeah. to, you know, to get rid of the king and what have you. But needless to say, um, there was that. And um, what, what struck me about this movie, because it's it is trying to 
have two things at once. It's trying to have a girl's fantasy life, which she, in, you know, she encounters fairies, uh, goes through some mystical tests, fights against demons, what have you, eventually to restore herself to her true father, which is a, you know, a king in the underworld, what have you. Against this backdrop is she's, you know, fighting against her evil stepfather, who's a, naturally a fascist, what have you. And the idea was like the reality of fascism was like they were just as monstrous as anything else. And and, and they were, the, and it's the fascists who are always telling her these fairy stories mean nothing. And they're false, this, that, and the other. And I kind of laugh at that because it's it's fundamental. It's just doing two things that bother me. Mm -hmm. One, it fundamentally misunderstands what the fascist ethos was in a kind of. I, I think really disingenuous way. Mm -hmm. And two, it's, it's also trying to glorify the communists in a way and like give gloss over to their reality. Yeah. Cause what was, you know, if for anybody who knows anything about fascism, be it, if you've read, you know, even if it's just hard right wingism of like Julius Evola, or if you read any of the just general thinkers on fascism, who in the world of, you know, man in his place in the world and what myth means which of those political ideologies is most likely to say myth is important. It's part of the society that, or it's, it's the piece of society that gives a meaning and wholeness to a person. It was the fascist. The fascists understood the concept of the irrational, the myth that governs and glues the society. Even if you weren't technically fascist, you were hard, right? Like uh, Ernst Jünger, you would understand this. Mm -hmm. The communists were the hard materialists who said, none of that is all, you know, bourgeois delusions or old yeah. feudalism, which no one has need of. They would have been the ones who were lying about, who would have said this is all bullshit, and a girl like you shouldn't believe in that. Yeah. Um, so to me, the the film was changing history to protect the people who actually would be the ones who would try to rip that bit of the soul out of the young girl, and they and the the idea that you were trying to have the fascist be the one who was, you know, the basically the one who doesn't have love or emotion or any type of irrational element to the site is just flat out wrong. Well, it's a and demonization so of the of the enemy. It's it, it. This is it's propaganda. It's the demonization of the enemy, and yeah. But go on. I'm I'm interrupting. Well, your and point so about the reason I bring that up is because you know, and the and the naturally the movie you know will admit it, it. This is what I also laugh. They do have like the priest, the local priest or bishop or what have you, hanging out with the fascists, what have you. But the reality of the situation, the governing, if you want to say myth of Spain, or at least the religious or you know irrational kind of mystical element of society was the church and one of the things that anybody will tell you about what was happening during that civil war even to the point where hardline atheists like george orwell would notice is like when they would burn down the churches the communists would just go out of the way to execute the priests burn down the churches go do anything in their power to get rid of the catholic church even some of those guys says i can't go that far and those, that was the degree to which the, the Civil War's intensity got itself and what the fascists were really fighting against. You have to remember that the, a lot of the fascists that you were seeing in Europe were different from the National Socialists in Germany, which was a, di a different form altogether. A lot of the fascists in Europe, particularly Spain, some degree Italy, in uh, Central Europe, like Hungary, you know, the Czech Republic, what have you, a lot of those were manifestations of hard right Catholicism. Yeah. And they were fighting specifically against, you know, the communist insurgency, which was actually having some successful revolutions and things were getting very dire in certain instances. So that's where they came out of uh, to do that, you know, to, to fight against that, as opposed to the National Socialists who had, a, you know, they weren't really fight. They were fighting communism, but they weren't really fighting against a revolution that had happened. They, you know, in Germany that had already kind of finished itself off by 1919. Uh, they were, you know, interested in other things, shall we say. So they're quite different beasts. Yeah, that, that's something that, that people don't seem to understand about the different strands of fascism. That, uh, yeah, the, the, the Nazis were, uh, well, I guess you call, you call them pagan, pagan atheist kind of thing. Because yeah, they were they, pretty pagan, yeah. Yeah, but they were, their paganism was not re like a real religion of paganism. It was more like, uh, like the LARPing of paganism. You know the standards of paganism, but at core they were atheists. I mean, that that's they wanted a, a state religion at the end of the day. Well, they the, wanted. I never looked into that specifically of the, about the Nazis, what they what they were aiming for religiously. But I always got the impression that that they were basically just uh, 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 just atheists uh, uh, in a very real sense, almost communist in their materialism. That's the sense I always got about, about from them. It was a little mixed, to be fair. So a lot of guys had different thoughts on this, but ultimately, if you really see. 
what the focus of their efforts were. They wanted the pageantry of the state yeah. to supplant the church. Yeah. And, you know, with the Fuhrer as the head of the church. And the if you ever look at the, you know, Triumph of the Will or any of the oh, great, yeah. Um, yeah. The great uh, you know, Triumph of the Will is enough. Yeah, that, that pretty much shows it all. You know, the, the one leader and the mass of people in the background, because that's what everything in Triumph of the Will, that was it. There was Hitler up front, you know, nicely squared up in, in the frame. And just a mass of people behind him. That, that great, greatest propaganda film ever made, you know. But yeah, and and and, to, and the other thing, you know, it, it's funny because I actually like going back to Franco. Why I think he's different to me, even though I think he's probably even more hardline than um, than um, Pinochet was. Mm -hmm. They seem that, he's my guy. I was going to go like <laughs> Pinochet was going to be. Or I think they're a good pair, you know, because it seems like they're fighting, or at least they're response to certain things kind of parallel each other i think franco's probably was a bit harsher uh than yeah. than pinochet was ultimately yeah but at was. the end of the day Fra look at what franco kind of tried to leave behind he's like okay after i'm gone yes uh you know uh juan carlos you're king now you get to decide kind of what's gonna be i you know he's it, it, even though i'm sure you know the the I don't know all the details. I'm sure his army and secret services were pretty, you know, harsh on the country. It doesn't seem to me anywhere near as totalitarian as, you know, the, the Soviet Union system was, for example, particularly in the hardest days of Stalinism. Harsh leader, of course, but, you know, ultimately, if you weren't like an asshole about most things, probably mostly benign for you. Yeah. Uh, insofar as, uh, you know, my guy, your guy is Franco. Well, my guy is Pinochet. My reasons are more pragmatic. Uh, first of all, um, do keep in mind, I did a whole video on him, so it, it's, in my, it's in my channel. But insofar as Pinochet is concerned, you have to understand one thing. He was not the leader of the coup d'etat. He was at the head of the coup d'etat at the time, but he was not the leader. He was certainly not the planner of it. Uh, the people who planned it were the other generals of the junta. And the reason being is because uh, uh, Pinochet had been named to the, be head of the army by Allende a month before the coup d'etat happened. And by this time, the parliament had already uh, issued a declaration asking the military to stage an intervention and to overthrow the Allende government. The parliament, I mean, think about that, okay? Imagine if, if the U.S. Congress... In, in, a, in, a, in a bipartisan, you know, resolution, uh, you know, both House and Senate, by a majority, asked the military to overthrow the, the duly elected uh, president of the republic. I mean, that would be pretty shocking, right? That's exactly what happened in Chile. Everybody wanted Allende gone. And the military obliged him on the 11th of September, 1973. But at that time, Pinochet was not the one who staged the coup. He was just at the head of it. It, it was presented to him as a fait accompli on the Sunday before the coup. Uh, the, the rumor has it, and, and I know this rumor from enough sources that, are, that were in a position to know that I, I believe this is a true story, that they went to his house on the day of his daughter's birthday. And uh, <laughs> while the kids were playing, you know, um, these military officers told him, look, either you're with us or you're going to be replaced right now. Okay, <laughs> uh, so, you know, you decide. Okay, you're going to be replaced right the fuck now because if, if you're not with us and you know this information, you're potentially a traitor, so we can't let you go. So you make up your mind. Either you're with us or you get in the car with us and we hold you in a military prison until this is all over. That's the rumor that I heard that that was basically the story. Okay. Part of me wishes you had said it was like on the day of his daughter's wedding. So like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I can't refuse you uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. request. On the day. I yeah. laugh at that, but it was funny. I, I had thought, and tell me if I'm misreading things. It wasn't like General Schneider. Uh, there was like another head of the army before Pinochet. Was, I yeah. think his name was General Schneider, who basically said, I will uphold the basically the, 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 the constitution. Yeah. And, and, and he the, was uh, shot. And the Allende government. Yeah. yeah, they got rid of him. I remember. Well, no, no, but, but it, was, it, was, uh, it was ugly and kind of pathetic. What happened was that uh, Schneider was an old school military officer, very well respected. And he, he said, you know, when Allende became president, he became president with barely a third of the popular vote, okay? Uh, that's why everybody was like shocked because it was not expected for him to win, okay? Uh, and it was sort of like the, the like the Trump moment, right? But worse because it was less it was less than half of the population voted for him. It was he basically won with thirty four percent of the vote, which was paradoxically fewer votes than he had gotten in nineteen sixty four when he had previously run. Okay, this is nineteen seventy. 
And so when uh, and in Chile at that time there was this not there was no second round, okay. And uh, Rene Schneider, you know, immediately went out, out on TV and said, "I'm the head of the army," which means that he's the head of the armed forces. Um, and uh, my sworn duty is to uphold the constitution, and I do not care who is president. I will uphold the constitution and be the sworn a servant of the democratically elected president of Chile. And, and everybody respected him. He went right away. He didn't fuck around. He was a very straightforward guy. This was in 1970, three years before the coup. And um, some right-wing nutcases, I mean, real fucking far-out crazies, okay? I mean, beyond Richard Spencer, okay? Who's, who's beyond Richard Spencer in, in, our, in our cosmology at this time? Uh, I can't think of somebody who's beyond, who's farther right than Richard Spencer. But anyway, these real right-wing crazies, they tried to, they had this weird plot that they were going to kidnap him and force him to stage a coup. It was fucking crazy, okay? And they tried to kidnap him and um, uh, Schneider took out his service revolver to defend himself. And in the ensuing melee, he was shot and killed. Uh, it was a tragedy. And the man who replaced him is really interesting. His name was Carlos Prats. And he is the great Hamlet of the Chilean situation because he vacillated. He vacillated between supporting the Indy government and uh, being against him. Uh, that's really fascinating history, but that's not he either here or there. The point I wanted to make was about uh, Pinochet. Pinochet, he became president, right? And, and sort of like, he, he didn't really earn it. He didn't really lead anything. He's just like sort of like the right man at the right time. But what happened was that the policies that he implemented and the things that he did grew the middle class in Chile so much that the possibility, the real possibility of communism ever becoming a, a relevant ideology vanished. And point of fact, in the, this was in 1973, but he did so many things that helped the middle class over, over the years and, and that into the future helped them so much that even in the last socialist government, uh, of uh, Michel Bachelet, which just ended and was replaced by a right-wing guy. Um, Michel Bachelet tried to implement like socialist shit. The majority, the vast majority of the, part of the people were against it and refused it, okay? Because she wanted to um, nationalize the uh, retirement accounts, the private retirement accounts, and mm -hmm. people were like very negative on that. And that pretty much showed that Pinochet's legacy endures and the things that he did for his people uh, uh, were good even though he's vilified in the West. They, they call him all kinds of things that are just totally not true, a lot of them. Uh, and a lot of the other things that are true, when you start to understand the context, they make a lot more sense. And you start to realize the vilification of the man is really unfounded. Anybody interested should check out that history. Yeah, but that's my, my uh, right-wing dictator that uh, should not be vilified. What's your next villain that uh, you think is... is is all that and more. I, I'm still thinking about this one. Why don't you take the the lead, and I'll 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 modify accordingly. Well, no, I only go back to Nixon because Nixon for me was like because now I, I, the other issue is the people that I that everybody that everybody says is a hero who I think is a villain, and and I got a whole host of people like that. I like Winston Churchill, FDR, Lincoln. You know, all kinds of people that I think on close examination, you start to realize that they were sons of bitches that really hurt their respective countries. And uh, yeah, I mean, you want to go in that direction? Well, if you, well, we could. But, uh, so I'll, 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 I'll do it a little differently. Uh, so I will start with someone who, uh, or not necessarily someone, but some ones who I would say, you know, had, were, un, un, were cruelly vilified, and that would be the America First crowd. So it's funny, you know. I don't know Trump enough says, about you know, that. You know, I, I honestly so, you know, don't know when enough. Trump's, when Trump says, you know, the phrase "America first, America first, you know, make America great again," that largely came out of a tendency in this country, which has existed. Arguably, its antecedents go back, at the very least, since George Washington's desire to avoid entangling alliances. But mostly, when people think of America first, think of it around the time of World War One, the interwar period, and early World War Two. The, that period of time you had, particularly amongst the Midwest, uh, amongst both right and left wing folks, people who decided that, you know, because of the shenanigans of World War I, uh, World War One, because of all of the craziness that's happening in Europe and America forced to pick a side one way or the other, the attitude was saying, look, we should just get out of that. Don't even participate in it. You know, it was in some sense, you know, very strong isolationism, but at the very, but even in its 
hardest form. It was more or less as it's not that like, you know, we're just never going to talk to anybody in the rest of the world. We're just not going to participate in a political attitude, like to cut, bring soldiers in and American boys in to go and fight, you know, World War One on behalf of people who don't give a shit about us to begin with. Right. The, the focus should always be on the domestic front. And the there's a lot of participants in there who, you know, names you wouldn't remember, but the names that you would remember would be like uh, Charles Lindbergh, obviously. It would be names like Gore Vidal. It would be, uh, you know, a guy named Bill Kaufman who writes a lot about this stuff, uh, wrote a good book called America First on a number of these players. Uh, and it even goes up to, you know, more contemporary guys like Pat Buchanan, who've been basically been the John the Baptist to Trump for a very long time. And he's probably even more articulate on the subject than Trump is. Actually, that's probably quite, quite obvious to yeah. say. But, this, <laughs> yeah. this, um, but the attack on this group has been continual and it's been consistent and it's then it takes more or less two or three forms. One is the idea that uh, they were nothing but appeasers to fascism. That was one of the very first accusations that was thrown against them in during world war ii in particular right. another accusation related to that was that they were all secretly or overtly anti-semitic and you actually get a lot of books and films kind of articulating this obviously the neoconservatives love to play it um if you look at things like the good shepherd you know which i actually kind of like that movie it's about the early history of the cia you do see in america first uh, meetings that are happening, but the reality they, they they always like to portray the, the CIA knows secretly that it's all run by pro fascists who are trying to support Hitler, and we're going to uncover them for the good of America. God blast it! Um, but then also like the think about all of the big players in there, like Charles Lindbergh. You know, the subject of frankly a Philip Roth book. You know about you know uh, the plot against America, which is what if Charles Lindbergh wins the presidency and it's like America becomes a, a pseudo fascist country. It's completely slanderous and absurd, but that was the, you know, the tone that that took. Uh, Pat Buchanan has been accused of anti-Semitism left, right, and center primarily because he thinks Israel's full of shit all yeah. the time. And we shouldn't be invested in that. Gore Vidal is the same way. Uh, actually, uh, I'm, you know, as you, if you keep, uh, you know, talking and entertaining the audience, I'll find a great quote that, um, that uh, <laughs> Gore said about the situation, and we could all see if you're if you're entertained by it. Uh, you, entertain the crowd. For yeah, me. yeah. Do you do you recall offhand what it what what the quote was? Yeah, yeah. So he was writing in um, the Nation, and he had a, an essay in 1986 called "The Empire Lovers Strike Back." Okay, and it that's was a good about title. Isra Israel and her Amer and, uh, and the American supporters of it. Um, so so well, responding, uh, you know, critics accused Vidal for his. Uh, attacked Vidal for his tone rather than his policy prescriptions. Always a neat way of stifling the heretic. The sentence that drew the most flack and that serves as the fair summary of the rest of the piece was Vidal's charge that, quote, like most of our Israeli fifth columnists, Midge, uh, Norman Podhoritz's wife, isn't much interested in what the Goyim were up to before Ellis Island. Yeah. And now that was the line that they said, oh, you see, Gore hates Jews. You know, he, he's always anti-Semitic. They're always, it's next crystal knock is coming. Wait, 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 wait. what was that line? The Israeli fifth column? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's he called them, yeah, like most of our Israeli fifth columnists, Midge, Decker, or Dector, Norman Podhoritz's wife, isn't much interested in what the Goyim were up to before Ellis Island. Yeah, yeah. Well, shit, let's go there. You know, the bottom line is that he's right. Okay, uh, the bottom line, at the end of the day, that he's absolutely right. There is an Israeli fifth column, and uh, they are very active and very successful. And everybody else sees them and sort of like pretends that they don't see them and, and, and just pretends that it's not going on. And if you ever mention it, you're an anti-Semite. But I think that everybody secretly sees it happening and is very disturbed by it. But they don't have the moral gumption, the moral self-confidence to say anything about it. It's pretty goddamn funny if you think of it, think about it, because like there there should be a whole host of people who do have the moral confidence to say it's fucking wrong that American foreign policy is directed for the good and be good and health and well being of the state of Israel and not for the good and health and well being of the state of America. What the fuck is going on? There should be a lot of people saying that, but nobody does. And if you do, you're an anti semite. Oh. Well, it's the simplest way of dismissing the argument because the other complicated thing that these, why I think these guys were heroes in a lot of ways is these were the 
some of the firmest and most consistent voices in saying America don't be an empire. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. Gore Vidal was a, could be a real bitch. In a, I mean that in, like in a literal way. way. <laughs> a literal way. I mean, yeah, yeah he, 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 was gay, he was gay, but to, to his benefit, he thought that gay identity and gay politics was mostly bullshit. And the only time he ever pushed it was he had a libertarian sensibility that you don't, you know, I wouldn't, he wouldn't put like, or he would, de, you know, de, um, decriminalize sodomy. But that was about all that he ever really said on the matter. But the biggest thing I think about him that I always kind of respected is he was very much the old Republican in the small yeah. R sense of yeah. the word. And he's very big in all of his books. He, there's, I'm going to read another quote because I actually think it's good. In his, he wrote a whole series of histories of the United States, you know, from the, you know, not chronologically written, but in order chronologically of the United States. It includes like Aaron Burr, his book on Lincoln, his book uh, called Empire, which was like, you know, kind of the turn of the century, 20th century novel. And he has an exchange in that book between the Secretary of State at the time, John Hay, and Henry Adams who was of the the John Adams lineage, he was famous for his histories of the United States, had a very small R Republican attitude himself. And there's this exchange in that book where they talk about the evolution of America. It says, John, it is it is empire you all want, and it is empire that you have got, and it's such a small price when you come to think of it. What price is that? Hay, Hay could tell from the glitter in Adams' eye that the answer would be highly unpleasant. Quote, the American Republic, you finally got rid of it for good. Yeah. And that was the general tone that he's in all of Vidal's writing. And like I said, even when he was a complete utter bitch about some things and they did said things that I thought were completely inappropriate, like basically saying, you know, giving hint that, you know, the Vietnamese were, you know, we, you know, American protesters of the war had the right to basically wave Vietnamese flags and wish death upon American soldiers implied in his statements, which I thought were shitty. But beyond that, his no, he was consistent said we do not and should not be a continual empire. We should be a Republic in the small R sense of the word. And he was consistent on that. And a lot of the American firsters were, but they got basically accused of things, which they frankly, if you really took the logic of what they're saying would never really become, they would never become fascists because they never believed in the authority of the state that much. You know, you would, they were always, you know, like I said, small R Republicans hated the imperial presidency, even, in, you know, when Vidal loves Lincoln in, on a personal level, he thinks he's a very brilliant man. He knows that Lincoln created the imperial presidency and it was the civil war that allowed all of this shit to happen very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. On a historical, on a historical level. Yes. Quickly. But it, it just, um, how can I put it? Um, I, I lost track of what we were talking about because it was it was what, what was the villain that you had originally? Well, the, the I don't know if it was a villain. It was just simply the it was the American. I was trying to defend the American first. Oh, the American firsters, yeah, um, yeah. Because I I was like I got really fascinated by Gore Vidal, and I was like thinking to myself of the confrontations that he had had with uh, what's his name William F. Buckley, right? William and Buckley, and yeah. the thing is, see, in that confrontation where he called him a crypto fascist, right? Why didn't Gore Vidal tried to rein in his baser impulses and present a more coherent argument. Because the fact of the matter is, his anti-imperial American vision is something very attractive. Why didn't he try to present it in a way that would have been more attractive? Because he came across as a loon a lot of times in his, in his public discourse. When he called uh, uh, Buckley a crypto-fascist, I, I think that uh, Buckley lost it a little bit when he said that he was going <laughs> to knock him out, like, basically. Listen, he but says, it, listen, you queer, I'm going <laughs> to sock you in your goddamn face, then you'll stay plastered. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly the quote. I know it verbatim. <laughs> okay, yeah. But the thing is, see, I, I understand uh, Buckley, okay? And at that moment, yeah, being called a crypto-fascist by this little poofter, fucking A, I... It pissed me off. I, I could understand him perfectly. Okay, so, so I, the context. I don't. Of, no, oh, sorry, I, yeah, yeah, I don't begrudge him that. But I'm saying, why didn't Gore Vidal uh, articulate his positions in a more uh, not conciliatory way, but in a way that was more attractive, that people could get behind it? Because he was so goddamn confrontational about his fucking ideas, a confrontational in a needless way of pissing off people. Because I looked at that, and frankly, I was on the side of Buckley, even though. Argue, on, on the arguments, on the ideas, on the principles, I'd be on the side of Gore Vidal. You, you see what I'm saying? So the context of that debate, it was around the time of the Chicago convention. And part of the reason Vidal responded, the only pro-war crypto fascist I can think of is yourself, is because Buckley had already made the statement that 
those uh, protesting uh, and, you know, in, you know, Chicago, those calling for, you know, American soldiers to be killed were effectively being crypto fascists. So, or, you know, Vidal's response is, you're the one who's really a crypto fascist. Basically, they were both acting in very base kind of ways for the television. It was the time. Uh, I thought, you know, both were kind of embarrassing. To me, the worst of Gore Vidal was in his personal life near the end when he basically treated everybody like shit. He was basically came across as a very angry queen, which is pretty much what he was. Yeah. And I think that was the worst part of it. But his fundamental principle on like the American Republic, I think, was fine. I think it may be related to why he was such a real bitch in life, because once he realized that's all gone, you just mis- you're just a miserable cunt for the rest of your life. What do you mean? What's all gone? His fame? His- you, the belief, no, no. The belief, the notion that America will become will restore itself to republican virtue and again in the small r. Once you realize that's gone, and it's all you know, really getting into the very base manifestations of itself. I can understand how he becomes a, a basically a bitter old cunt at the at the end of his yeah, days. But, but you he, know, once it's like losing your virginity. Insofar as a republic becoming an empire, once you lose it, it's gone forever. You, there's no getting it back. And you just have to, you know, just, just, just negotiate how to move forward. But there's no, no going back. Yeah, no, I get it. And the, thing, the worst part for him is he was old enough to have lived through some of you know, the older ways. As his grandfather, uh, I think something gore, I forget the guy's Yeah, they, they were very established people. Very stylish, and were very much. He, he was like, and an, they were very strongly like an anti FDR New Dealer mm-hmm. as well. Like they were Democrats, but more or less hated the FDR's sort of totalitarian attitudes towards a lot of things. That was another thing you don't hear about in history. A lot of Democrats did think FDR was a tyrant. Um, oh, he was. You know, but that, he was. Yeah, but, <laughs> he was. <laughs> that's not. Yeah, that's it. Well, yeah, that's just. You know, that's more for the next episode. The that's, that's that's for the next episode. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but uh, okay. And so far as this episode is concerned, of the America Firsters, that they were not the villains. Yeah, I, I think that the whole notion of of a a of trying to get back into kind of like a Republican uh, mindset, it's not going to happen uh, in a true sense, but you can make the effort to sort of like reduce the scale of the empire, but the empire remains. But, but yeah, of course, and all this stuff about anti-Semitism, I'm sick and tired of every fucking person who criticizes Israel being labeled an anti-Semite. I know that I'm going to be labeled an anti-Semite at any time now. Um, a couple of times I have been, you know, in my comment section, they've said, oh, you're like anti-Semitic and shit. And I'm like, yeah, but I've seen you being accused of being a Jew as well, so I just say it's a wash. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. But anyway, uh, so what's the next? What's your next uh, uh, villain who's really a hero? Well, you got to go next. I went twice in a row, man. No, like I, I'm, I'm trying to think here. You know, Nixon is my guy. Nixon is the one that for me is just like, yeah, he was my guy. Uh, the the other one, I. Um, it's that I sort of like have a soft spot for him, and you're gonna, you're gonna, your hair is gonna stand on end. It's sort of Jimmy Carter. Uh, okay. No, no, I understand. I, I, I was, I was afraid of saying it to myself, but I do kind of like Jimmy. Yeah. Even though I think there's some problems with Jimmy. Oh yeah, he was a disaster I, in a lot of ways. But in in a lot of senses, like the moral centeredness of the guy, his 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 very milk toast and unwillingness to do anything particularly rash, except at the very end when he. When 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 his bet noir became the fucking hostages that you know screwed it, 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 it screwed his mind really, and and the and the Iranians who trolled the ever living shit out of him by releasing the hostages on the day of Reagan's inauguration. I mean that's the ultimate troll, and they mind fucked him. Okay, and, and that was obvious to the whole fucking world. But in general, uh, it seemed to me that Jimmy Carter sort of like managed the 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 post Vietnam situation fairly well. Uh, uh, um, I, I don't think he was a great president by any stretch of the imagination, but he was... Uh, um, do, do you see what I'm saying? Well, I'll, I'll frame it this way. I think a lot of what he did was a failure, both domestically and internationally, yeah. more so internationally. I think in particular his worst decision, and I'm saying this as a Polak, was to allow Brzezinski to be, I think, National Security Advisor or Secretary of State, I forget which role he had, I think National Security Advisor, and got us, it started getting us involved in Afghanistan. And my response was, we fucked that situation up. I get it, I understand why they wanted to have the Soviets bleed a little bit, but I know all everything that fell out from that was because a Polak was getting revenge on the Russians, finally. 
That's well, no, how no, I no. interpret I, a lot I, I of it. I think that that was like, actually a good decision. I think that was an excellent decision, as a matter of fact. That came blowback to us like you wouldn't believe. I yeah, disagree. 30 years me. later, okay? 30 or, years later is nothing in terms of history. Yeah, I know, I know. But the thing is, he, it was... It was impossible to have predicted how that blowback was going to happen. And at the time, it made a hell of a lot of sense. Give, give the, the, the Soviets a little Vietnam of their own. It was a, a fucking masterful decision. It cost practically nothing. And, and it bled the Soviets dry, you know, and it broke the Soviet military. Uh, uh, yeah, well, that, it would later break the American military. That's another story. Precisely. Yeah, I'm not doubting that. Do you hear me doubting that? No, but look, these are de decisions that were made in 1970-something. Uh, what was it, 78 or whatever? I think it was a very smart decision. Knowing full well what would happen later, I still would have, if I, if I had been in uh, uh, Jimmy Carter's shoes and Brzezinski's shoes, I would have gone ahead with the same plan, arm the Mujahideen and deal with them later. You know, uh, uh, I would have dealt with them later in a better way. But uh, no, 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 I, I, I was, no, it, it was the right decision tactically and strategically at that time with the chessboard at that position. Because, see, that's the thing. So many, you know, armchair historians, right, they talk about shit that happened later as effects of the effects. But you got to look at the chessboard as it is. I mean, that's the thing that you're taught when you start learning to play chess, when you... You're in charge to learn to play chess seriously, right? You got to look at the board as it is at that time, not how it's going to be later, because you don't know later. Okay. Don't teach your grandmother how to suck eggs here. I, <laughs> okay. I, I know how to play. I know how to do the chess board here. You, t I, I mean, I think it's utterly absurd to take one look at the Mujahideen, take one look at Osama bin Laden, and say, "Yeah, that that's going to be fine by us." You know what I mean? Uh, Who could have hilarious. predicted that he was going to wind up flying planes into the fucking World Trade Center? Okay. By 1993, you knew, which was only a few years after the whole. It was, uh, was 12. No, it was 14 years, 15 years after the, 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 the first weapons got shipped to Afghanistan. Yes, but only a few years after the last weapons well, got well, finished. Uh, oh, you're talking the 93 bombing of the World Trade Center. Yeah, okay, after 93, then yeah, sure, they should have fucking kept an eye on the fucker or else just put a bullet between his eyes, right? Uh, yeah, that's that's different, but no, 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 no. I, I totally disagree. And it was a smart well, move because it accelerated the collapse of the Soviet Union. Had the Soviet Union not had Afghanistan, it would have lasted a good long while longer, at least another 10 years. That war no. really crippled the, the, the Soviet's uh, uh, military infrastructure. It really hurt them. Okay. It hurt them psychologically. It didn't really hurt the infrastructure. I mean, it, it, those okay, soldiers let me, let me who fought there yeah. were, 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 were. Let me rephrase it. The, the psychological impact, in a, in a very real sense, is just as important because the psychological impact uh, uh, made them crumble in their will to maintain the Soviet Union. Do you honestly think that they would have allowed the Warsaw Pact to collapse as abruptly as it ha as it did? Uh, had there been no Afghanistan? Yes, because the problems that were happening domestically in the Soviet Union were bigger and longer developing than the war in Afghanistan precipitated. Well, okay. Well, look, we'll never know the answer. Okay. But going back to Jimmy Carter. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah we, we didn't get to my point. I was saying, I, I was just giving an example. Okay, yeah, that was a failure. But Jimmy Carter had the clearest moral indictment of the American situation at hand when he gave his malaise speech. Now, people made fun of him for that speech because they said, oh, he's just a miserable old fuck. But if you listen to what he says, it's fundamentally a conservative argument. He says, you know, the country used to be defined by, you know, strong families, close-knit communities and our faith in God. Now we're defined not by what one does, but by what one owns. And that's a crisis of confidence. And nothing is worse than a nation that has no confidence. Yeah. He, he pretty much, uh, he, he, it was an accurate description at the time and more accurate. Uh, you know, I have heard that, uh, read that script, that script, that speech in, in a number of years. I'm going to reread it. But uh, I believe Hendrik Hertzberg wrote it. Yeah, but, but it is more accurate because I, I remember the malaise line and everybody talking about it at the time. Uh, I don't remember the specifics that well. Do, do you happen to have it on hand, or do you know it off offhand? That well, I have always have like that video clip which I've uh, read. I hang on. Let me pull up Jimmy Carter's Melez speech. 
very long, unfortunately. So. No, oh, yeah, yeah, was, yeah. Because he gave long speeches. I remember when the TV would break in for one of his speeches, and everybody would groan because it would just go on and on and on. And I, the fucker was worse than me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, and you agree. Thank you. <laughs> I feel so much better. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's only because I was half paying attention while I was reading the text. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so. uh, but yeah, here's, you know, our, uh, here's two paragraphs here that I'll read. I've already kind of read one. Our people are losing that, are losing that faith, uh, that faith in the days that our, uh, our children would be in a, would live in a world better than our own. Our people are losing that faith, not only in government itself, but in the ability of citizens to serve as the ultimate rulers and shapers of our democracy. As a people, we know our past and we are proud of it. Our progress has been part of the living history of America, even the world. We always believed that we were part of a great movement of humanity itself called democracy, involved in the search for freedom, and that belief has always strengthened us in our purpose. But just as we are losing our confidence in the future, we are always so beginning to close the door on our past. In a nation that was proud of hard work, strong families, close-knit communities, and our faith in God, too many of us now tend to worship self-indulgence and consumption. Human identity is no longer defined by what one does, but by what one owns. But we've discovered that owning things and consuming things does not satisfy our longing for meaning. We le we've learned that piling up of material goods cannot fill the emptiness of lives which have no confidence or purpose. Can you imagine a politician giving that speech today? Well, no. In the aftermath, ironically enough, of Reagan, you know, because Reagan defined himself as the opposite of the speech, which is you know, bye, bye, America, bye. <laughs> well, no, or, or more importantly, America is the ultimate reset button, which is to say you can forget everything and start again. Now, to a certain extent, that has value because you need to be able to, in some sense, be free of the burdens of continual self doubt. Yeah. But yeah. at the same time, you know, you're also free of the obligations of the past. So that was the double edged sword with Reagan. Yeah, because uh, I, I can tell you, as a man getting older, the, the the things that you regret or the things that make you squirm about your past, they weigh on your mind more heavily than the good things that you did. Uh, you might have done done a hundred good things and two squirmy things, but those two squirmy things weigh on you, and the ability to just like forget them and to set them in the past that's invaluable, certainly for a nation, because a nation cannot be beholden to the problems of the past. Um, but right. it, it's really interesting how how the speech that that uh, Carter gave was nearly spiritual. If you think about context, yes, he was a religious. I mean, he, we all know he's a religious man, a Protestant. But you know, we can we can let bygones be bygones. Well, no, no, not really. You know, he's a fucking uh, you know pagan, as far as I'm concerned. But. Yeah, he's a, but needless to say, he 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 really. You, if you could, whenever you listen to him speak, speak, it's part of his motivation, his his faith. Whether you think he's full of it on sometimes or not, that it's part of who he is. Yeah, no, but I mean, no, no, kidding aside, the the man is is a genuinely pious individual, and and um, he 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 means no harm to anybody, and I think that he's uh, an individual whom I think is often misguided in what he thinks is the good, but I, I think that he genuinely tries for the good. I, I think that there is no malice in the man's heart, and I think that there's never been such malice. Uh, uh, truly. And he's, I, another one, he's another one who got lambasted with the anti-Semitism argument. Oh, when, when did he get lambasted for being anti-Semitic? When he said, uh, uh, Israel, uh, Republic, not apartheid, or he basically suggested that, oh, that recently. Israel was operating. Yeah, yeah. yeah if, not too long ago, because he's been, ever since his presidency, he's been trying to push for... Uh, peace in that area of the uh, of the world to no avail, I'd say. But the other sign in my mind that he always had, or that he was the more honest, or at least the least vitriolic of the former presidents who are still living, he was the only former president of the United States who did not speak ill of President Trump in a real s substantial kind of way. He certainly during the campaign, I'm sure he, you know he stuck with his party, but when it came, pres you know, Trump as president. He was not on the list of guys who are saying, "Oh, you know, I, you know, he's doing wrong things, this, that, and the other." No, I think Carter tried to give him space to do his thing, which is a minor thing to some people, but not to me. No, it isn't to me either because it's uh, you know, I, I've I've always been very forthright about my thinking about uh, uh, Jimmy Carter that I think that he's kind of like a buffoon, but he's been a very effective buffoon. So more power to him. Um, 
Oh, by the way, did you hear the the Ben Shapiro thing about uh, Trump? I mean, Ben Shapiro is losing his shit over Trump. What the fuck is the matter with the guy? Uh, uh, because Trump didn't make him the nominee for the Supreme Court of the United States. God damn it. Uh, no, but uh, my favorite thing is, it, you know, just uncovered today, which still makes me laugh, was a Ben Shapiro article during the election season of 16 saying, like, Trump will never put a real conservative on the Supreme Court. And he's done it twice now. Yeah. Or he's he's about to do it twice, I should say. Yeah, yeah. I know. I mean, like, Shapiro is losing his shit over, over the guy. He's, he's looking like a fool. And um, he can't admit that he's wrong. And that is a, 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 that is a horrible, horrible uh, uh, flaw. But anyway, going back to Jimmy Carter, um, his, his presidency, it, it wasn't a good presidency, but it was the best for the times, if, if that makes any sense. Uh, I, I think that retrospectively, the, we, the, the, uh, the United States needed like sort of like a, like a, like a, a sort of like a reset. And I think that that was like the pause before the reset. That was Reagan. The Reagan was the reset. But we needed that pause because relatively little happened during the the Carter you, presidency. You needed you needed a boring time to put yeah. it mildly. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not even saying that dismissively. You know, you needed like you know, let's just let's have a president who we're not really worried about getting into like a big imbroglio. And the worst thing, like you said, that happened with Carter was the hostage situation. Um, and, well, and also the economy, unfortunately, during his time really started having trouble because of the gas shortages. And there was just like yeah, a yeah, yeah, the, the, No, the, it was the, the uh, Iranian thing in January of 79 that was just very badly handled by the, um, by the Carter administration. I'm not talking about the hostages. Fuck the hostages. That was trivial. It was uh, the, the uh, collapse of the Iranian oil production because of the revolution. Okay, first of all, they should have fucking seen that fucking guy. Okay? Uh, secondly... When the Shah went, flew to the United States to receive cancer treatment, he, he would eventually die in the United States by 1980, I think. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. See, that, that was a fucking mistake. See, see the, the, um, the Americans fucked up in Iran terribly. Uh, they, they put the, the wrong guy in charge, and they knew he was the wrong guy in charge, okay? Uh, the, the Americans during Eisenhower uh, um, had over... Had, they didn't directly overthrow him, but they created the conditions where he was easily overthrown. The the duly elected prime Moses. minister, Moses, yeah. And uh, insofar as the Shah of Iran was concerned, the Shah was just fucking nuts, and everybody knew it. Everybody knew that he was fucking out of his gourd, and they should have been working to create a long term solution to the Iranian problem. Iran is the natural ally of the United States. Because the, the people of the Iran, for the most part, want to have a nice secular state, okay? Uh, I think that the Iranian Republic is, is uh, it's a very interesting experiment, if you think about it, insofar as governance is concerned. Uh, I don't think that it is long-term stable. Uh, and I also think that the Iranian people don't want it long-term either. But as a, as a counterbalance to the insanity of the Shah of Iran, it was inevitable. And the Americans are responsible for the Shah. And they were in, uh, responsible for the Shah for keeping him propped up because of the fucking Iranian oil. And that blew up in the United States' face. Talk about blowback. That's fucking blowback, right? Um, uh, Iranian oil production dropped, I think it was, I, I, if memory served me right, it was something like, I, I, I want to say like 6 million barrels of oil a day, it dropped to zero. Okay, And that was a catastrophic hit to the global oil markets because it represented... In one fell swoop, something like eleven percent of the uh, of the global um, uh, supply, um, or global production rather. I mean, it was a monster hit, uh, and OPEC swooped in and used that to ratchet up prices and just you know break the American economy. They re they really did. They really did break the American economy. I mean, I remember it very clearly. I remember my parents taking both cars um, to get gas, and I'd have to stay at home with my little sister. And my parents would go and get gas for the cars. You know, it was like a big hassle uh, because there were lines. There were lines. And, and the thing is, see, there was enough gasoline, but there was the fear that it was going to go up in price that you better buy and top up now because the difference in price could be that substantial. And there's also the, the issue of hysteria. And, and people started saying shit like, oh, you know, it's going to go up to $50 a gallon because it, it already peaked out at like $4 a gallon or something like that which was mm -hmm. really fucking scary for people. who had At been, that time? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. It's like, let's put it this way. $4 for gas now is high. Yeah, exactly. It would be equivalent. I mean, there's been like, a, it's only like 200% uh, rise in income since 1980. So imagine if it, if it were like, uh, like say, what, uh, $12 per gallon. It would scare the shit out of people. If, if people were saying, realistically saying, if, if it were $12 a gallon now, and people were realistically saying that it could go as high as 50, it would freak the shit out of people, right? And, and they'd be doing all kinds of crazy ass panicky shit. It broke the American car industry. Nobody wanted to buy the big cars anymore. Uh, all of a sudden, right. from one day to the next, everybody wanted a small car. And they would pay whatever was necessary to get a small fuel-efficient car. Uh, that's why Toyota and Honda and, and, and Nissan, they all, you know, they, they, their sales exploded over this thing. It, it was really, and it was a, a mismanagement. I think a mismanagement of expectations, uh, a failure of leadership, and to see what was going on. Okay, so the Carter administration, yeah, okay, he was not as incompetent as he's painted, but at the same time, he was not that competent. He was not that great. Uh, I, I, I guess it's it's sort of like you know, in, insofar as you know, villains are concerned, he's a minor villain if you want to put it that way, and I put him as a minor hero, but not that heroic. It was more like the sense that he right. just calmed things down after. Okay, that's my guy. What about you? I I actually think uh, the only other guy I was going to bring up, and I feel like it's going to merit its own episode, and I'm not fully prepared to talk about him, is our president's favorite president, apparently, Andrew Jackson. We should do uh, a whole episode on him. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm looking at, I'm looking at the time we've we've absconded from you, dear yeah. listeners, and, yeah, and we, we we're pro- it's a good episode length. Uh, so I want to save him for his own little merry-go-round because he's worth it. Yeah. Anybody who can be, sh- you know, a guy tries to shoot at you twice, he fails, so you punch him and nearly beat the shit out of him <laughs> into his death, deserves his own episode. I'm yes. just going to say that. Yes, exactly. And so with that story, dear uh, listener, we're going to call it a podcast. This is uh, this has been Coach Red Pill. This has been the Coach and Benway podcast. Uh, so I'm signing off for you. And Dr. Benway, why don't you give us, uh, lead us out with the final words. Uh, be the next conquistador. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good one. Be the next conquistador. Be the conquistador of the savages of your life. Yes, yes. Now we're talking. Okay. So with that, take it easy. Bye.